Well, Europe can avoid a euro crisis if it wants. The crisis with Greece was a kind of contrived crisis. Uh, Germany wanted to bring uh, Greece under its heel, uh, as it were. Uh, it used the European Central Bank to do that. Actually, it, it created uh, a massive run on the Greek banks just at the time of the referendum uh, of uh, Cyprus uh, a few years ago. So it was a political move. Um, and politics uh, and money <laughs> are intertwined, as I think is a theme uh, of uh, your uh, podcasts. Uh, so the the Eurozone can work if the underlying politics of Europe works, if, if the European politics is uh, pulling uh, itself to pieces, then the Eurozone doesn't function. Uh, so I, I regard this not as a technical set of issues, but as a matter of uh, regional politics and global geopolitics. Yeah, and some people say that, um, especially also, I think, in the US, uh, prior to the launch of the euro, that the euro uh, cannot uh, be sustainable in the long run because it doesn't meet the conditions of a optimal currency area. I, I participated in uh, those discussions. That's how old I am. So I uh, wrote papers uh, back in the 1980s and early 1990s, pointing out that the United States, for example, has a federal fiscal structure. Uh, when one state gets in trouble, uh, it pays less taxes to the center and it receives more transfers from the center. And so there's an evening out through a federal budget. Europe doesn't have a, a federal budget. Uh, obviously, that's been one of the issues of debate uh, for the last 50 years in Europe. There's a little bit of a uh, Brussels-based budget, about 1% of the GDP uh, of uh, the European-wide economy. Uh, it's not enough for any kind of stabilization. Uh, and so there are deeper tensions uh, in uh, the Eurozone than would be the case if uh, Europe was a federal state, that's for sure. But there is, was a second feature, which is that uh, the uh, dollar or the Eurozone holds together if the central bank acts as a lender of last resort, because financial markets are intrinsically unstable. Uh, they're subject to self-fulfilling crises. Uh, this was actually one of the recent Nobel Prizes in economics of uh, Diamond and Divvig. And uh, they're subject to bank runs. One of the ways that you stop those self-fulfilling crises is the lender of last resort actions of the central bank. But the European Central Bank uh, is really a, a interesting institution. First, it didn't have a clear assigned role as lender of last resort. Second, the Bundesbank objected to uh, the role of the European Central Bank as lender of last resort. I don't think the Germans have it, or those Germans who, uh, like Wiedemann, who opposed a, a lender of last resort capacity had the macroeconomics right, in my view. Uh, they did not. But uh, Europe uh, was really uh, limited uh, in uh, that basic central banking function. And under Trichet, uh, it didn't perform lender of last resort functions. And that's almost brought the Eurozone down. When Draghi came in, uh, he de facto uh, introduced the lender of last resort functionality, except in the case of uh, Greece, which was uh, a political target uh, more than uh, a, a macroeconomic uh, object. So all of this is to say making a currency area work is both a matter of underlying politics, of fiscal policy, and of monetary policy. And Europe uh, has most of what it takes to make it work, but it's very uh, subject to uh, the fact that even today, unbelievably, uh, 60 what is it, 67 years since the Treaty of Rome in 1957, Europe doesn't get along very well <laughs> internally uh, to, to this moment. Um, and that means that uh, a common currency is uh, fraught, with the, fraught with the challenges. 
Yeah, there's so many internal uh, differences between the member states, uh, of course, linguistically, culturally, economically, uh, but also in terms of interests. And um, I I would say that the the tragedy or the fate of of Europe is that we should be united in order to actually uh, become an effective um, global player in order to compete against the US, Russia, China, India. But it seems like we're too divided to to become that player and, and that we um, are, are never able to get there. How do you see that? Well, I, I see that exactly the same way you've just summarized it, which is that once upon a time, uh, being a nation was a, a large entity uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, we were dealing with the city-states uh, often, uh, uh, but then came uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, that kind of set a standard uh, in, uh, in the Western world and history. But after uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe was never united again uh, in, uh, in, in the way that it uh, mostly was uh, during the Roman imperial period. And Europe fought like hell with each other for uh, more than a thousand years. And for someone like me trying to appreciate uh, this history and being a Europhile in general uh, and uh, liking uh, the different parts of Europe very much, uh, it just seems uh, very bloody minded to me. But I would say that um, for a lot of modern European history, 17th, 18th, 19th century, Europe was the world. Uh, So the competition among the European powers was a competition among the imperial powers. There was uh, imperial uh, uh, I- I- imperial uh, competition uh, uh, that led to lots of wars within Europe and lots of wars uh, in uh, other parts of the world between the European powers. But the, the whole point is that by now, uh, being the Netherlands or being Denmark or even being France or Germany is not big enough in this world. Uh, by virtue of changes of technology, which increase scale economies everywhere, and by the fact that we're globally interconnected, it's just like you say, Europe is now uh, among some giants. Uh, The United States, relatively large, uh, uh, an economy that uh, is you know, comparable to the EU economy, let's say, but it's one country. Uh, And then we have China, India, Russia. So if Europe is going to be divided among 27 bickering countries, uh, it's not going to stand much chance uh, of autonomous uh, action or uh, security in a world of a few major powers. And those major powers are not going away, uh, and they don't have Europe's interest uh, at heart the way that Europe should. Uh, And so Europe should get its act together and actually cooperate. Uh, And it would understand things a lot better than it does now. There are many problems of European cooperation, but I would say that um, one is all the traditional enmities and divides. Uh, second is, I, I, I won't use the expression old Europe and new Europe uh, in terms of EU membership, but uh, there are big differences of Western and Eastern Europe uh, in uh, political, geographic, cultural, and economic outlook. I've been involved very heavily in Eastern Europe over more than 30 years uh, in this. Uh, Europe is very much weakened by its kind of chronic dependency on the United States. Uh, and many of Europe's politicians are basically bought off agents of the United States rather than really looking after Europe's interests. And so this idea of Europe as a vassal of the United States is sadly true. I say sadly as an American because I find American foreign policy to be pretty obnoxious most of the time. Uh, and getting Europe into uh, terrible problems. So Europe doesn't have a coherent view 
uh, vis-a-vis the United States or vis-a-vis Russia or vis-a-vis China. Uh, And that's a shame because it leaves uh, Europe quite exposed, quite divided, quite confused, and without effective political leadership. I can't think of one effective political leader in Europe right now. They have no one to call, right? Uh, When you're in the US or China, you want to call someone. I know all these people for decades now, and um, I don't like what I see. Uh, I don't like what they say. I don't uh, like how they interact. Uh, I think they've got Ukraine completely wrong. I think they've got China completely wrong. And I think they've got the United States completely wrong. But if if they got it so completely wrong and we conclude that it's um, it's proven to be very difficult amongst all these member states due to all the difference to work together, wouldn't it be wise then then completely reconsider Europe's strategy and think, okay, let's just go back to trade. That's what uh, that's what worked. Um, and And maybe let them all be sovereign, independent nations focusing on trade, uh, neutrality, peace, uh, and, and instead of trying to be this, 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 this world power, um, is, would that be maybe an, a, a, a smart move? You know, I don't think it's really feasible, actually, because Europe will get picked apart uh, that way. The US will use Europe for its own devices or the friendly governments. It will topple governments that it doesn't like. It will intervene. Russia will play games. China will play games. Remember China, which I like, by the way, I'm a Sinophile. Uh, but you know, China had its uh, 16 plus one uh, arrangement where uh, Central and Eastern Europe was uh, very cooperative with China. I, I thought from a European point of view, that's a big mistake. Uh, this should be EU with China, not half of EU with China. Um, And that's not because I'm against China. Uh, It's because I'm uh, for Europe, uh, you know, finding its feet on the ground. So I don't think we're in a world in which individual nations, even linked by a free trade agreement or a single market, is enough anymore. I think we are in a world of regions uh, and the regions uh, basically, well, China, but beyond China, it could become a Northeast Asia region of China, Japan, and Korea actually on the same side. Uh, ASEAN will be a region, uh, the Arab region, the African Union, uh, the United States, which doesn't get along with almost anybody. Uh, but uh, Europe needs <laughs> unity. Now, what's, what Europe is missing is some leadership, because there were periods during uh, the construction of the community and then the union where there, I think there was real leadership and coherence. Uh, but right now, there isn't. Uh, right now, the leadership is terrible. I, van der Leyen is useless. For Europe, uh, yeah. she's uh, she really is, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, just in the hands of the U.S. State Department. It's it's really pathetic. Or NATO, I mean, maybe her highest aspiration was to head NATO, but it's pathetic because that's not what Europe is. Um, and Schultz is uh, obviously an extraordinarily weak Chancellor of Germany. Macron, well. If you don't like what he says today, wait till what he says tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to be different. Uh, and Miracle, and- was she that type of leader that uh, that that was able to uh, to sort of be be a strong leader worldwide, where people could rely on, that people could call, and in, and in, in when there, whatever there was trouble. I liked Merkel a lot. Uh, I thought she was uh, solid uh, and impressive. I liked Helmut Kohl a lot. Uh, I thought he knew what he was doing. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are other leaders of Europe that I very much admired, uh, Romano Prodi, both uh, as a European president uh, and as Italian prime minister, was uh, extremely capable and important. But right now, in Germany, France, Italy, the major uh, traditional powers of the European Union the leadership is 
absolutely, uh, absolutely insufficient, if not incoherent, uh, and also so much under the thumb of the United States, it's really hard to understand and imagine. And Poland, where I worked a lot, I was their main economic advisor uh, in the first years of the transformation. I helped Poland a lot. That uh, deep Russophobia, maybe understandable, is not helpful for Poland's future uh, or constructive right now. Uh, and yeah, let's let's move to to the Ukraine and and what should be the coherent strategy um, uh, for Europe. Um, you of course have been very outspoken when it comes to how this war uh, in Ukraine should be ended. You have very um, explicit and clear um, proposals for peace. Could you? Uh, summarize how your ideal plan for peace would look like in Ukraine. Look, the, the basic point is clear. Ukraine should have been a buffer zone uh, between Europe and Russia, a safety zone, a safety zone between NATO and Russia. Didn't mean the end of Ukrainian sovereignty. In fact, the opposite. Nothing's wrong with neutrality. Uh, and uh, neutrality worked just fine for Sweden, Finland, Austria, Switzerland. And the reason it worked is Russia wanted a buffer the same way that the West wanted a buffer. And then the United States got it into its bloody head that we want Ukraine for us and we want to be on Russia's border. And many hotheads in the United States wanted Russia to further disintegrate. 1991 wasn't enough ending the Soviet Union. Now let's have Russia fall apart. And no doubt there was a strong CIA component of saying, we'll surround Russia, we'll weaken Russia, we'll do regime change. Uh, there are many crazy ideas in Washington. Now, Europe understood most of this uh, and when George W. Bush Jr. was pushing NATO enlargement in 2008 to Ukraine and to Bucharest, European leaders privately were saying to him, George, don't do that. And Europe's and U.S. top diplomats like our current CIA director, William Burns, who in 2008 was the U.S. ambassador to Russia was writing back cables, this is absolutely a red line. Don't push NATO. But, you know, the U.S. is filled with stupid people in the security state. And they're arrogant. And they said, we won the Cold War. We can do what we want. We don't have to listen to anyone. We don't have to listen to Europe's leaders. We don't have to listen to Putin. We don't have to listen to anyone. Ukraine will become part of NATO. This is where we are. This is so obvious. Even Jens Stoltenberg admits this. He says it, but then the European leaders are either lying or stupid when they deny this. Because they, NATO, no, it's not NATO. But Stoltenberg says, yes, this is a war about NATO. And then they don't have the common sense. If it's a war about NATO, is it really, uh, really right that we go to the brink of nuclear war to make Ukraine part of NATO, as opposed to making Ukraine safe and neutral? And is it really true, as the propaganda has it right now, oh, you can't be safe and neutral because Putin is uh, either Hitler or Peter the Great or whatever nonsense is uh, propounded by our propaganda in the West right now. It's sheer nonsense. If people actually understand the history of any of this, they will understand that the U.S. provoked, provoked, provoked. The Europeans knew it. They kept quiet because they're afraid of their overlord, the United States, their protector, their nuclear shield, whatever it is. So they don't speak honestly. But now I'm not sure that the current crop of leaders even understands this history. Uh, if you work a little bit at it, it's not so hard to understand. For me, I've seen it firsthand close up over the last 30 years. 
because I was an advisor to Gorbachev. I was an advisor to Yeltsin. I was an advisor to Kuchma, the second president of independent Ukraine. I know yeah. these people. I know what happened. I know what European leaders have told me over the years. So all of this is to say, what's the answer to this? A neutral Ukraine. And why Macron or Schultz or anyone believes that NATO and Ukraine is either feasible or even the right thing to do if it were feasible, absolutely bewilders me. And Jens Stoltenberg, who I've known since he was prime minister of Norway, what the hell is he talking about with hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians already dead? And he says, Ukraine will be part of NATO. Well, yes, Jens, over all of our dead bodies. Come yeah. on. 